Tara, give me a moment to um, share this right quick. All right, you guys, it is talk therapy. It is Tuesday, May 19th. And uh, I'm excited. We have some great guests on tonight. Okay. That was me. <laughs> I got to take care of it. All right. um, we have some great guests on tonight and I'm excited um, to share I guess you know we've been talking about situations around COVID-19 so tonight we are going to continue continue those conversations I am your host Tara T. Stallings and I am Melody Manning and we are talk therapy I'm excited for tonight because we got some special guests on here tonight with us that's going to talk about COVID-19 in the education system so I'm, I'm really excited. I'm happy to have you, Roslyn, and I'm also happy to have you, have you, Gabriel. You all are going to bring some information. We've got one more guest that's going to be joining us a little later on to talk about some stuff. So if you have children that are in school, you want to take a listen and find out what's going on um, to assist the kids with their education and learning and how all of this um, has actually affected their learning for the year. Because as we know, towards the end of the school year, um, the kids were shifted to learning at home, to virtual learning. So we've got some professionals here with us. And I want the ladies to introduce and tell a little bit about themselves um, for you all. And if you have any questions, please drop your questions. Um, they'll be happy to answer them. And we're just going to have good conversation. And we can start with you, Rosalind. Before you ladies start, Listeners, um, viewers, make sure you like and share, tag a friend, tag a parent so that they can hear this conversation. If you are a parent of elementary, middle, high school, uh, even college, tag a friend, share this post, do a watch party so this information can um, get out. Rosalind. Um, okay, my name is Rosalind Cato. Um, I have been teaching for um, 18 going on 19 years. I have taught six through 12th grade. Um, my specialty is English, but I am certified in social studies and I'm also certified in um, leadership. Um, what other questions am I answering about myself? <laughs> <laughs> um, and she is my friend. <laughs> yes, yes. Lo look, longer than I've longer than I've been teaching, we've been friends. So. Yes. That's, that's how I get to get I get on the on the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Tara, her husband was a classmate of mine, so all of those Silver Bluff folks again. We, yeah, the we bluff. <laughs> So cool. Yes. Yes. Gabrielle. Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Gabrielle Gator. Um, I am originally from Texas. I moved to New York um, two years ago. Um, but I have been teaching. I'm going on my fourth year teaching. I am a certified uh, sixth grade ELA teacher. Um, and I also um, have a master's in um both education and educational leadership. Um, I currently, I, last year I started my own tutoring agency um, that helps to cultivate learning um, for students who need that individual one-on-one -on -one private tutoring. And I specialize in making sure that the, the lessons are culturally relevant and tailored to the instruction that that specific student needs. Um, Yes. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that's well needed. Mm -hmm. Well needed. Yes. Well yeah. needed. 
Yeah. I was just thinking I'm I, I'm going to hit you up after this game. <laughs> yes, please so. do because you know it wasn't I wasn't seen in the classroom, so I took matters in my own hands and hey, I Hey, and sometimes that's what we got to do. That's what we got to do. You got to bring it to life. <laughs> Gabriel, can you share? You said it's culture. It's the the lessons that you have are culturally friendly for the um for the for the student. Can you share yeah. a little bit about that to our listeners and our sure. viewers? Um, a, it's a, like culturally relevant and culturally responsive, meaning mm -hmm. based off of my experience and what I've seen in the classroom, a lot of the students that get overlooked or labeled a certain way um get kind of pushed to the side or they get a label on that and that goes throughout them throughout their academic career mm -hmm. um, i also saw that missing cultural piece and when i say that i'm saying black and brown voices mm -hmm. um, those are the primarily the students that i teach and i feel like a lot of the curriculums that i've dealt with do not speak to them and my students were not engaged because i don't feel like they were seeing themselves in the curriculum so when I tutor these kids, and most of the, now we tutor all students, but a lot of my students I tutor are black and brown students. Um, I make sure to pull in that cultural piece, meaning that you are looking at passages that um, highlight or empower black and brown students. When we are doing read alouds, we're looking at um, books that promote black, black and brown students. Um, you know, I make sure that I, I bring that cultural piece um, and not even just like skin color. Also, when it comes to how the, the curriculum is delivered, um, especially during this time of COVID, incorporate technology, incorporate technology, lingo, like hashtags, Twitter, all those things, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, just making sure that it's it's accessible for uh, every student and to keep them engaged. So. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I want to say this because um, me and me and Tara, we had this conversation, and I and I say this all the time. Um, my children are grown, but I have grandbabies, um, and I'm really concerned about their education. And one thing I always tell my daughter is, you have to get to know the teachers because I truly feel that it is a it takes a special anointing to be a teacher. Um, just because someone has a degree or someone got a job does not make them an actual teacher because you got so many different little minds that you're dealing with at one time that you know how have to know how to deal with each one individually to make sure that they get it and listening to what i've heard from both of you so far i'm really really impressed that both of you are saying that you got to make it come alive you got to go there because i like that because it does it takes a special person to be a teacher and i'm 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 very happy that you all on the show to speak from that point. Yes. I've always um, said that if, you know, the Lord didn't whisper in your ear to become a teacher, it's probably not for you <laughs> because it's, it's not a glamorous job at all. Um, but to um, tag on to what um, Gabrielle just said, I have been blessed to be in a district where we have curriculum that is set up, but most of my leadership has always really just let me pull whatever I needed for my kids in. So may, they might have this book, but the principal where I am right now, if I need something, I'm like, I need this book and this book will highlight somebody like Gabrielle said, if it doesn't look like them, it's not going to pull their interest. Mm -hmm. And you want them, you want to teach them different aspects of literacy, but it's hard to teach them something if they're not interested in the in the in what they're reading at all. Um, so I've been blessed that I've been able to do that. I can. Um, I said I want Dear Martin by Nick Stone, and they'll get me Dear Martin. They, you know, I I wanted to. Uh, read uh, 145th Street by Walter Dean Myers and I got it, you know, mm -hmm. so the things that were interesting to the children that I'm keeping them engaged and while I'm keeping them engaged, then I can teach them. If I can't, if they're not interested, I can't teach them. So, you, I mean, that's one thing you got to spark the interest. Well, let me ask you both this question with the COVID-19 and and the kids being sent home for virtual learning for a little while, how do you think that's going to affect the upcoming school year once they're back in a classroom? Hmm. 
I think there's going to, there's always been a push for more technology. Technology has taken over. It's, I mean, from the time I started to where we are right now, it's um, a huge part of that. I had a, a whole, we used to have to go and get the, the mobile labs. Now I have one, I had one in my classroom. It was just mine and my kids were assigned their own, um, you know, their own particular tablet. So it's, it's a very intricate part of the curriculum now. I know there are different, um, my county in particular is starting a, a new system where a lot of things are gonna be online and it's something that teachers are gonna have to train in. Um, but we do have different things. I have, my kids write papers and they send them to me. I don't, they don't print anything. They send it to me, I grade it online. They had a system where they could put everything. They had virtual folders, all of that. So when we got into, the, into this situation where we had to go home early, it, was, it, was, it wasn't seamless, um, but it wasn't that, it wasn't completely difficult for me because I already had my kids already doing things virtually. Okay. So um, for me, for us to shift it, now the only thing I can say, the, the literature, it, I had a, a couple of places I could go for them to get the literature. I try to get it as interesting and as relevant as I could. Um, but that was a little limited. So I'm thinking we'll probably pull more pieces in for that um, by the time the new school year starts, because right now we don't know, are we going back full force? Is it gonna be um, adapted in certain ways? I don't know. So we're gonna have to find some different other ways to incorporate um, into the virtual learning center. Um, but it, it's, it's been a challenge, but um, it was um, it wasn't like I said it wasn't seamless for me, um, but it wasn't completely difficult. It was just some different avenues that you have to take. What about you, Gabrielle? Um, that's a loaded question. I think that first off, I know that we got shut down right around test time, mm -hmm. and so off the rip after the test, I know the the push for the lessons and to get it done and get this and get this in and understand that, that starts to, it, it starts to get more lax. So we were kind of on the back end of that slide, at least in my particular school. I think where the students are going to end up um, when they go back to phys physical school is going to depend on how um, the school handled this virtual learning situation. Um, if it was a lot of like, Let's be honest, like busy work that wasn't getting checked and there wasn't a lot of feedback and it wasn't rigorous, um, then I feel like they're going to be at a disadvantage. However, if the student, if the teacher was still supplying them with work that was cut short, but it still hit that skill and they still kind of had that expectation, like, yes, you're still going to get a grade. Um, and, you know, this is still, I still want you to get this to prepare you for next year. I feel like those students are still going to be as prepared as they were if we would have been in a physical classroom. Um, so I think that's a school by school basis. But the second yeah. piece for me, what I've seen, um, the biggest part of this has been the social um, and environmental part. And by that, I mean, um, I think it brought light to, um, for a lot of teachers who weren't seeing this in the past about what that student's home looks like, you know? Um, at this time, honestly, I saw a quote that said, we're not grading skill, we're grading privilege and access, right? So you have one student who has a mom or a dad there coaching them, do your work, blah, blah. Then you have another student whose mom may be an essential worker or whose family member has COVID. Or, you know, I found out one of my students was going from shelter to shelter in this. Mm -hmm. And these are things that at, in sixth grade, they don't have the, the emotional words to describe what they're going through. You just see them shut down, right? And that we see that in the classroom and they're like, oh, do your homework. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you read these pages? Now we know why. And I feel like as teachers, we can take this as a eye-opening example to show um, you know, what, what it looks like to be in a productive work environment and what it looks like when that student goes home. You get what I'm saying? Right. So, exactly. Um, hopefully a lot of teachers will kind of get this and, you know, when it comes to like sending home homework or sending, oh, do this with your parents and blah, blah, blah. Everybody can't do everything with their parents. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Some people got to take care of their siblings when they get home, you know? Um, so I saw that from, I have, I've seen that and um, I made different avenues 
in my teaching instructions, I, I wouldn't have a lunch. My lunch, I would pull kids who I know. I was like, if you know that your house is not quiet enough for you to read the book, you can come read the book in here. You can eat in my room. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but everybody wasn't doing that. So hopefully this sheds light on that and we address our curriculum to meet the needs of our students more. I want to say something to, um, especially to the homeschool, and Melanie was talking about that. And I'm glad you brought that point up because a lot of parents don't have the mental competency to teach their children. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of parents don't have internet, they don't have computers, but they don't have the mental capacity and competency to be able to even help them with their homework outside of being sent home to be homeschooled, you know, just on a regular school year. So um, how difficult, you know, was it for those children and even the parents, because you have some parents that are willing and able, but do you have those other parents that are able and not willing? And then you have those other ones, they're not able and they're not willing. <laughs> so, <laughs> to help their children. And we've seen that across the board. And those children, maybe they were already on the, um, on the, on the fence of failure. You know, where do they fall? Well, I think, I, I think uh, uh, Gabrielle had a great point. Um, one, it, it really takes the teacher to know their kids. Mm -hmm. um, by the time we went home, it was March. So I had had my students for a year, not to mention the fact that I knew my students prior because I uh, was the instructional coach at the middle school. So I already knew most of their situations. But as a teacher, um, I was not going to send home new stuff that they weren't going to be able to do. For one, um, things that I was not going to be able to stand over them um, and make sure that I could assist with, that's not what I was trying to send home. Did I want to send things home that were going to strengthen the, the things that I'd already taught? Yes, but I'm not going to send something home because I am a true proponent that I am the teacher. Your mother is not. I get the whole idea that, oh, the parents have to participate. I get it. But at the end of the day, I'm their teacher. So there's a certain expectation that I have so I'm not gonna put more on them than what I know they can handle. We, as uh, the district, knew our situation and we knew that we had a lot of students who were not gonna be able to get the technology and have those, um, the tablets or the iPads or whatever to do the work. So we made sure that they had I, everything that I assigned, I had paper. I had it all. So they, if you need to come get it from the school, you can come get it from the school. Um, I wasn't going to send anything that I couldn't print that they couldn't access. Um, because you do have some that just don't have it. They might actually have a device, but they don't have the Wi-Fi at home. Before we went out, I made sure that, you know, this, this company is giving free Wi-Fi, this one, this one, because you know your students and you know what they are dealing with. Um, so I think it really comes down to um, the teacher being very aware of who they teach, the situations that might actually come to pass with these students and making everything accessible for them and not, not being as stringent to say that, oh, either is this or this. It's not always going to be black or white. It could be a gray area because all of them weren't gonna be able to do it. I can't sit up and hold them accountable if they don't have a tablet. You see what I'm saying? If they don't have the, the ability to do the work in that way, I can't fault them for that. So I'm not gonna hold that against them. I really, I think it comes down to uh, the, the teacher paying attention to their surroundings and knowing the kids that they teach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That has been, um, when you were speaking, um, Tara, to the, the mental capacity the parents have. Um, for me, um, I teach uh, in an area in, in New York, um, Washington Heights, which is primarily um, Dominican, Latino, Latina. Um, a lot of the parents, and when I say a lot, um, almost majority of some of my students, they don't have English speakers at home. So um, I speak enough Spanish, you know, but um, it's been 
uh, like it, that in itself has been a challenge. So when it comes to accessing the materials, you know, it's very easy for a kid who does speak English and for a parent who don't speak English, you're like, oh, I did it already. All she wanted me to do is this. And they can't go and check and see, you know what I mean? So exactly. that language barrier has been, and you know, there's Google Translate, blah, blah, blah. But I like that one-on-one -on -one communication. Like I don't need no, any other barriers, you know? So um, for me, that, that has been a challenge. And um, I have never cried in the classroom, you know, nothing like that. But I, I, my heart broke for a lot of these students and the situations that they were going through. Um, and just because um, I don't necessarily work in a school where I kind of have the autonomy to pick and choose like what we can do. I, I, I originally was under the assumption that, oh, we weren't going to like, we were actually starting a new unit. And I was like, there's no way we're going to start this new unit. We don't have the books, blah, blah, blah. We did start the unit, in the, even though the students did not have the books, they had to read the books online. So, like, from the mm. jump, we had issues. Like, That's issues. Issues. And on top of that, we were talking about um, Jamestown and Native Americans and how. Oh, God. And it was from the wrong perspective. It was just like off the bat, like a no. <laughs> oh, my so, gosh. That was such an unfair. Oh, my I was gosh. Really <laughs> but. From the time I was hired at that school, and she told me what the unit was, the first day I was, I looked at her like, "What? Have you read the book? Oh, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It was not fine, you know. And I, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> not at all. I shed a light, and luck. However, though, the school I work at, the leadership is also pushing to have that cultural piece. Um, so they were acceptable to my feedback, and so we were reworking the entire curriculum itself before this happened. Um, so I am teaching online. I'm teaching students who don't have access, like Ro Miss Rosalind was saying. Um, I'm teaching students whose parents don't speak English. Um, they have a hard time grappling with the skill. And on top of that, I have to teach them the cultural relevancy piece of what happened with the Native Americans in James. Exactly. <laughs> oh, wow. Bless your heart. I'd be happy when it's, we almost done. <laughs> so, um, Gary, how much longer do you all have left in your school term um i teach at a year-round school so we go till mm -hmm. june no my bad we go to july 1st and then we start back august something um no. <laughs> wow <laughs> <Whatever>. <laughs> that's how i am too when they tell me to come back exactly um <laughs> but we have um like two week breaks we have a two week an extra two week break in um october like we have little two week breaks here and there that are spread oh. out I don't have a whole summer is like chopped up. Oh, wow. We wow. technically don't have a whole summer anymore either. So mm -hmm. I feel you. Mm. You feel that? Okay. Yeah. Well, let, let me ask you this because if my kids are grown again, with um, Gabrielle mentioning the curriculum, my understanding is each grade has a certain amount of studies that they have to complete before the end of that school term. Am I correct? They still do it that way? Mm -hmm. There's certain things that they have. It, it's different with English because English um, is it, it, continuous. It's conti yeah, it's it just keeps okay. going. And you keep building to mm -hmm. it. But there are certain things that they need to learn in sixth grade. So when you get to seventh grade, it's uh, you can build a little bit more. And the same thing with math too. Don't get me to lying about math because I know <laughs> nothing about it. But I know there's certain things that you have to know before you can get to you know another part of math. So yeah, yeah there's certain things that they have to know. So with the kids with school and not introducing basically anything new to them when the school turn went to home base. How are they going to handle that the next, you know, school term? Are they out the beginning of the year to kind of catch up what they didn't do, um, get introduced to at the end of the previous one? Or do you all have any idea as to how that's going to go that maybe parents can prep their children in this downtime for the next term? Um, I can just, no, we haven't been told how we're even going to come back. Um, and I, I, what it looks like is that it's, it looks like it's varying state to state, even with how they're mm -hmm. opening up the city. Um, but 
what I do, or what I've seen as an educator, and I'm sure Ms. Rosalind has seen this as well, is like the idea of a summer slide. So just like, just assuming that, you know, you want all the students to read over the summer and you want them to do all of these things. Of course we do. You want that, you know, but they come back, you know, that summer brand new. So I think, I don't think parents should be anxious about them being prepared. Um, but I do think that they should be pushing um, that because, you know, I'm ELA. So that literacy piece in a fun kind of way, um, ways I've done it, I'm doing it in my classes through like, oh, read a book with a friend and, you know, different things like that. And you can listen to the book and you can watch, you know, but um, not so it's so much like read this, write this, mm -hmm. answer the you know. Um, but I do feel like a lot of teachers, no matter whether it's a pandemic or not, we anticipate like the students coming off like, like the they first, didn't learn a thing, right? Exactly. Just like <laughs> okay. Norms and transitions, and, and this is how you enter the classroom, and this is where this is, you know. Yeah, so you got to reteach. Yeah. So from the jump, we're gonna we 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 were going to reteach regardless. I feel like it'll be more work on the teachers to prep them for this um, than it necessarily will be. Like I don't want parents to be like, oh, I don't want them to be behind when they go to the next grade. Um, we all are on the same page. We're all behind, yeah. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was going to say the same thing. It's, it's really uh, what we learn after testing is uh, getting them prepared for the next year. And like she said, we always have to reteach. What we okay. taught that last, those last few months, because all the kids are thinking about is getting out of school. Yep. So they're not retaining. You know, they're mm -hmm. doing it not not to retain but let me just get through this so we're going to have to go through the whole thing again in august so it's going to be the same thing um but like i said we have no idea how we're going to open back up so I, I really we and we haven't heard anything either so we'll see tara did you have anything you wanted to um I'm just like you know it's just it's it was such a surprise to close up um and when we have this pandemic it affect it's still affecting everyone um but you know we always have people that's going to point the finger well, you know we should be doing this we should be doing that you know but we've never been in this space ever we've never been here we've never traveled this road and you have educators like yourself, you have, I'm, I'm a grandparent like Melody, <laughs> um, um, and you have parents and grandparents like, you know, like us that are concerned about our children and grandchildren and their education and how this has affected them uh, academically, but also emotionally, um, also emotionally. Um, you have, you know, just like in, in every state, you have people that are are, are 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 being vigilant and taking this pandemic seriously. But then you have those others that are just like, oh, oh well, I got free time. <laughs> yeah. I got free time to hang and have a good time, and I'm not doing anything. We're gonna party. We're gonna do this. We're gonna do that. And the children are the ones that end up getting the short stick um, at home and academically. So how do you how do you think going forward we're going to be able to bridge that gap with those children? I, I don't think this is going to sound really crass, but this isn't anything that we haven't dealt with prior. Okay. The pandemic is sure, but having those parents who are only there when you take their cell phone that hasn't changed okay you know what i'm saying so we still have to reach that student on a whole different level because there is no connect there's no connection there that's why i tell people is everybody always thinks that teaching is um just simply abc it's not it has not been that way for me for years i have students that i i'm still in contact with from my first year teaching Wow. Because you have to build relationships with these kids so that they know that, oh, it's something else 
this is, it's, oh, I don't actually have to stay like this. Oh, it actually is somebody who is on my side that's going to support me. I still have that. So even if it wasn't a pandemic, you still going to have some kids that are going to fall through the cracks. So it's all about, okay, is it going to be a little bit more difficult? Like you said, we haven't been through this before. Maybe. I'm not quite sure. Am I going to change how I, you know, I change from kid to kid, depending on what their need is. Mm-hmm. But whatever, you know, whoever needs me, the Lord puts them in my space mm-hmm. so that I can be purposeful in whatever they need. So it's kind of like on a needs basis, <laughs> maybe, but the need has always been there, whether we were in a pandemic or not. I'm glad that I totally agree. And I'm, I'm glad that um, y'all both brought up that point about emotional and um, dealing with this space um, and what it looks like when students are dealing with this space, like this whole thing. And then even what it looks like from the parent side. Mm-hmm. And this is a very vulnerable state. And, you know, now I'm using my personal cell phone to call parents and to text parents and to FaceTime. And You know, I was raised with a certain type of manners. You know, I teach kids up north, but these had to, I had to amp them up because before I even get on the phone and ask them why wasn't so-and-so in class today, the first thing out of my mouth is, is everything, are you guys doing all right? um, Is so-and-so able to come to class? Because you never know what's going on on the end of that at the end of that household, you know, mm-hmm. and it may look mm-hmm. like a mom is avoiding your calls. She may be having an emotional breakdown, you know, like, um, so I feel like that emotional piece is key when it comes to dealing with families who have a lot going on, you know, and getting that buy-in. And that was something that I, like um, Ms. Rosen said, I had to learn from before the pandemic, especially because I, I taught in Harlem, you know what I'm saying? So like mm-hmm. Harlem kids, it's a lot going on in that area and a lot of them kind of raise themselves you know so right. and then you meet with the mama and then you see why you know what I mean so, exactly uh, <laughs> just, it, it's very important that like um I kind of have this demeanor where I just you know I don't emotionally respond negatively or like kind of like um get defensive and more of like opening to be being able to adapt to whatever social environment is going on in that household. So the key, I think, to bridging that gap is that relationship building with both the parent and the student, because you can have the student respect you and not the parent, and then it won't work. And the parent respects you and not the student, and then that won't work either, you know? So you got to get everybody on the same. On board, right. Right, right, right. (laughs) So, yeah. Now, um, speaking of emotional, I was reading earlier where um, our area was approved for part of a grant and uh, the their portion to go towards summer school for the kids. Um, what is it, did I, I think I said, is it fifth through high school, Tara, is what I mentioned? I can't remember, or either oh, eighth through high part. school. Yeah, I think that for the, for the emotional grant, I know there was a technology grant that we just got. That that was a hundred dollar, a hundred thousand dollar grant. Um, because I had just read it, it was in the Augusta Chronicle. And um Richmond County is supposed to be using it for summer school resources mm-hmm. and to offer additional online assistance for students that feel like they need it for the summer. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, I read that Jefferson County is using theirs um to assist with on the mental side of dealing with the pandemic and the students in school, which I found to be very interesting and kind of want to dig a little deeper as to what may be going on if they decided to use their funds that way. Um, but had you heard anything about that, Rosalind, or tell the parent, or are you able to tell the parents how they can find out information about what actually is available for the students for the summer programs? Well, I know that uh, we did receive a grant, but I believe that we're using it for technology and for summer school, correct? Okay. Um, Because uh, we had a lot of students, we passed out computers, but now we we collected them back 
but we were really focused on our seniors because a lot of them, you know, we're trying to make sure that they're going to actually walk. So we wanted to make sure that they had all their, uh, you know, their I's dotted and their T's crossed. Um, but as far as Jefferson County, that they were hit really hard with the Corona, with the COVID-19. Am I correct? Isn't that the county that was, it was hit really hard? Jefferson County is Wren's, um, goodness, what else was considered Jefferson County? Uh, I Louis had the whole Louis list in there. Wren's, Louisville area, Millen, that area. I, I'm not quite sure. I know it was a, a one a county here that was hit particularly hard. With, it was a small area. So well, I don't know if maybe hard. that was, that was the reason why they wanted to actually focus on, um, you know, the emotional piece. Um, because there have been a, a more people affected in that area, maybe I'm not quite sure, but I have not heard any anything about um, Richmond or Columbia County, for that matter, um, doing anything as far as um, emotional. But everything that's for those, both all the counties, really, you can go to their website. I know ours. You can always get all the information on the website. They usually keep that updated um, weekly. Gabrielle, in your area, um, are they doing anything special for the kids or do you have anything special? Because I think I saw on your um, Facebook that you got like a reading program for the kids for the summer. Yes, ma'am. I am doing a um, literacy camp <clears throat> that I did in person um, last, last summer. And it was for like the teens, it was called Lit Literacy. And so that is spilling over into the virtual world through private tutoring. And then I will um, have something um, that's free and accessible for the community to kind of, um, so kids can also feel like they're a part of something that kind of mimics what we were doing um, in the lit, lit literacy, which was, um, it was about four days and the students would come and we would have like, uh, kind of circle discussion over a book called The Skin I'm In by Sharon Flake. Oh, that's awesome. I love that book. I love I, that too. Yes, I am working <laughs> on writing a curriculum that is around that book. So a lot of the things I want to include in my curriculum, I use in that, um, it's basically kind of like a cute book club. Um, and I sneak a little skills in there. But like I said, like for the summertime, when I was a kid, my mom used to give me a workbook. It was like, all right, you got these pages to complete. You know, but um, <laughs> yeah. She was a teacher too, but my thing is like, I didn't want to do that as a teen, you know, it's like, or what, you know, so I want to kind of make it more um, conversational and um, social. So I'm looking at how to piece that online. And I'm also offering that one, those one-on-one -on -one services for um, students who may, who were behind before this happened, right? And right. this is even harder because it, I think personally, it has, what I've seen, it has hit students with um, individualized education plans the hardest because it's so hard to give those services virtually. I mean, I have right. students who don't speak English, who cannot write their name, and who are on a low reading level. And then you get on the phone with the parent, and the and parent they don't speak English either. And they just, you know, so that was an issue in the classroom, and virtually it's on a whole nother level, right? So um, every situation is different. You know, um, I, I tutor kids that have all kind of um, different learning um, needs because of the lack of it may be looked over in class. Um, and speaking to that emotional piece, I, I try to sneak it into my um, warm ups, you know, and having them kind of chat out just something to get their minds off of what's going on. You know, um, I see them engage with that when they're when they're coming into Zoom, I'll play like a little music, you know, just to get them excited about the class or whatever. But um, speaking specifically to New York, I know that the, the status for um, the amount of social workers that we have access to is one for every 1,000 kids, I believe. Ooh, yeah. uh, so I can imagine that they would need that. New York needs a lot of that. You know, we have a high ratio of students um, and huge class size, which is a thing everywhere. But that emotional piece, I feel like, hit New York really, really hard. So it has been a very sensitive subject every time we meet. Um, as a great team le level, I'm learning about so and so's dad passed away. So mm. and then and then for my student demographic, it's not just 
what's going on in New York, right? It's also because they have family in other countries. The way this is hitting other countries is not even being advertised or uh, uh, brought okay. to mm -hmm. right? Um, so I had a student who family was in Ecuador. Four of the family members had passed away, and we didn't even know about it, you know. And dealing with that, somebody's family in Mexico passed away. We didn't don't know about. So. I, I really hope that Governor Cuomo is taking that into consideration when he is passing these different um, uh, bills that show where the allocation of the funding is going to go. So yeah, Shout out to Governor Cuomo. He's doing an awesome job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he is. He is. Awesome. That is awesome. Now you were going to ask a question? Well, I, I guess... <laughs> I guess it's a hypothetical question. Um, my theory, you know, we're, we're not going to go back to what we were used to. We're going to have a new norm for us. And I know some classrooms can have quite a few kids in them. Um, and, I, and I guess maybe you all don't know, maybe the, the school systems are trying to play it by ear. Are they going to reduce the size? other classrooms or um, <laughs> just for kids safety it's I guess it's just really all up in the air <laughs> yeah as to how they're going to do things because those were some of the concerns for me and um that I had expressed with Tara I'm like well you know some of those class have over 20 20 students in them you know and you're talking about mm. social distancing over How 20. Right. <laughs> 30. <laughs> exactly. My largest class was 36. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, the student teacher rate, well, yeah, I'm old. Yeah, it's just student me. Teacher, <laughs> student teacher ratio obviously has increased a good oh, bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, oh, my dear, especially if you have a class that's an inclusion class. What? Yes. Even though I have a teacher in there with me, but still. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My wow. first year teaching, I had 31 in the class and we didn't have enough desks and it was just me. And this was my first year. So I tried to make it cute. We had chairs. I took some chairs from the teacher's lounge and I was like, OK, who gets to sit in a special chair today? You know, and if somebody was absent, then you could sit in a seat. But it wasn't enough chairs to go around. And a lot of schools, at least charter schools, because my, my first school was a charter school, get away with that by they add how many people are in the building. And they add that to the amount of adults that are in the classroom. And then that will bring down that ratio that makes it look like you have mm. out of adults oh, wow. this many students. But it was really just Yeah, you know. yeah the, the student the, the <laughs> to student ratio is such a myth. It's like oh, an urban wow. legend. You're right. I feel like <laughs> oh, I'm wow. at a concert in one of my exactly. classes. <laughs> I know. I know. But you know, that really comes down to a budget issue. Yes. Um, and not only a budget issue, but really, I don't know about uh, any place else, but we really don't have a whole lot of people that are just, you know, hankering to be teachers. Mm -hmm. it's difficult to oh, get wow. people to come into the profession um, and deal with all the different aspects that it, that like we were just talking about is more than just going in there. And sometimes you're not just telling them what to write on the paper, you giving them the paper and the pencil. Right, right. You know? right. I that a little bit because um, you know, I work in the school system, but I go in and do groups. So, and I, you know, and of course, Robin is my friend, so <laughs> and we work together and do a thing. So, I do know, you know, we said at the beginning of the show that it takes a, a, a Melody said, a, and you said, a special anointing, a special grace to be a teacher. And you said, and I saw Gabrielle shake her head, you don't have teachers. You don't have people running to be in the no. teaching profession anymore like you saw that 20, 30 years ago. You have people that have been in the teaching profession uh, five, 10 years, and they're getting out going to another career because they're like, mm, I'm not doing this. <laughs> I, I'm not I'm seeing, this. I've seen people teach too, and like, look, that's a wrap. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> How is that affecting? Um, how is that affecting the atmosphere in the school and also with the children when you have teachers that don't want to be there um and they're not they don't have the passion they don't have the grace to teach the children and the children feel it 
you know, they, they, they're feeling that negative energy that's coming from that teacher because one, they don't want to be there. And two, a lot of those teachers, they just don't like the kids. Now, mind you kids, there's some, some bad kids now. It's some bad, <laughs> bad kids. It's some bad kids. Okay. And it's some even even worse parents. Um, <laughs> but besides the fact, how do you you know how's that affecting the, the atmosphere in the school? Oh, it's it's always been there though. Um, geez, I was always the teacher that um, the kids came to <laughs> because so and so don't like me. Mm-hmm. Well, they was coming to me. Um, <laughs> I don't know. You, I, some of them, you just have to really uh, almost show the other the teachers that these are they're likable kids, but they're kids. <laughs> they're kids that are living. Some are like uh, Gabrielle said, they're living adult lives and they're living things that when I was a kid, I didn't have to experience. Um, but sadly, they do. Um, and you just have to really show these show the teachers they're kids. They are. Um, you can manipulate them. Yep. You know, you can. You're, you're not saying in a bad way, but you can mold them into the child that you want. <laughs> yep. I feel like a lot, I agree with you 100%. And a lot of teaching, um, when you get those students, is undoing or teaching, unlearning things that have been told to them consistently, whether right. it's actually told to them or um, directed at them in a way where they could feel it. You know, um, I, I, I could not tell you how many conversations I've had with teachers who were just here to teach to the top. And what that means is just like teaching, I just, I'm just here for the smart kids. Right. And the rest of them, they just not gonna get it. I've seen teachers um, purposely move kids around where they have the, the smart kids up front and then they get the kids that don't wanna learn. I just put them in the back. Um, I've heard, I've had teachers come at me my first year of teaching because, you know, it's my first year, like I'm here for everybody, whatever. Um, I'm the advocate and I still am. Oh, they um, were salty with you. Oh, yeah. I, I was, um, <laughs> advocating for this, this two groups of, um, <clears throat> these two minority students, um, who acted one way in the class, but they didn't act that way with me. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to those students, I love to have those, uh, shut the door conversations. Like, let me talk to you real quick, you know, um. <laughs> Don't shut that door. But um, exactly. Ain't no them, cameras in here. No. Right. <laughs> Just and, play on Facebook. Just play. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, but then it's also like, let me talk to you as if you were my child. Like, mm-hmm. I'm black. You black. Let's talk about what this looks like to other people who teach you who right. are like me and what it's coming off as and for the rest of your life what it's going to look like i see that you are this type of person but when you come in so-and-so's room with a bad attitude she gonna automatically think you are she not reading you. you this right so i said that to say i um advocated for two students to be placed in a like advanced program um and while i was at my desk and there were students in the room i had a teacher storm into the room and basically um, cussed me out in front of the kids, asking me, why the F did I recommend these two students, they don't know S-H-I-T, you know, in front of the, the kids and the kids hearing their name, hearing how the teacher speaks about them. And then she wonders why they act such and such way in, in the classroom. So I've, I've seen it. I've heard it. I even heard it in high school when I would go back and mentor my middle school um, students to teach them how high school was like when we would teach to the AP kids, oh, like get in dual credit, you need to get an AP classes, you need to do this, you need to do that. Great. And then they leave and then you get in Texas, I don't know what it's called in Georgia when I was growing up, they called them the regular kids or the neighborhood kids. Um, you would get those students and that's what they were called. And um, and then my teacher would say, oh, the hood kids. The hood kids. Now these are regular kids now. Oh, the regular kids. Okay. Yeah, he told me, um, just focus on the fun stuff, like the, the dance and the football. This is in middle school. Um, so from the jump. They the, already categorized them. Why would I show to up to school with a pencil? Why would I? You don't care. So I feel like that is weeded out immediately. And, and that was in Texas. When I came to New York, you know, you think um, it's the first day of school. You know, kids a little scared. They a little quiet. And then you think they wake up. And then you see their personalities. It's opposite in New York, right? 
and it's because of so many teachers when you get to these um, neighborhoods with these type of environmental situations going on um, a lot of teachers will come um, to kind of try to save these kids and then leave you know so they're in the middle of the school year so they're used to people walking out on them so they're giving you all they got from the jump like oh who is this she thinks she from tech bop 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 I was like uh uh come on let's step outside no no let's let's talk outside you know like <laughs> let's talk about it and it's like a one on one like you know but but um, needless to say, later on in that year, that same little girl was crying when I left. You know what I mean? And it's just like breaking that boundaries and, and patience. And like I said, like kids are going there because they want you to go there with them. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And it's just like just sitting back and be like, okay. All right. And I mean, I have seen, I'm sure Miss Rosen, you've seen a lot too, you know. Yeah, but I didn't handle it as well as you did. <laughs> Believe me. Oh, no, I, I got some more stories, you know. Girl, we go, look, we'll talk later. <laughs> right. <laughs> but just coming back, like, it's a new day, you know. And, and the thing in New York is, I would see those kids um, on the bus. I would see those kids on the subway. I would see those kids when I'm, I lived where they live, you know. Um, so, it's really um, that that patience piece, um, building up those relationships. And when you have those problematic students, you have to think about where they came from. I saw those same kids. I would be on the block, like out with my friends, and I see you out talking about I'm carrying a package for somebody, and it's nine o'clock at night. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. things like that. Do you know what I'm saying? And I'm not seeing that it was just it br brings a whole new perspective to that the profession. So it's not. It's far from just teaching the curriculum. It's more like I'm trying to get to you emotionally, you know. Um, right. You're trying to stick because you actually are doing more than because you can learn all the ABCs and one, two, threes, but you still got to maneuver life. Right. Mm -hmm. You still got to handle things that are going to get thrown at you by from people and just things in general that you have no control over. So you're trying to build character. You're trying to build. I want this young man to be uh marketable i want him to be able to go out and, and sustain mm -hmm. a career and and life and, and take care of his family and you know what i mean you just want all that i love it when i see my kids doing well uh, my mm -hmm. husband um just he has like two of my kids working with him and i'm so freaking excited i'm like what they're <laughs> 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 working at the hospital i'm so excited because I don't want to read about them in the jail report. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got enough of them like that. So when I see the, them doing good, that is like a pat on the back for me. And I might have had them one, two years, but I'm happy to see it. And I think that that goes to what we put in them. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that their parents don't do it, but you do have those occasions when the parents just are not able. They're not able to do it. So that's where you got to pick it up. And if you're not willing to do that, this this not for you. Mm -hmm. well, it sounds like you ladies are um, you're more than just teachers. You are advocates. You are social workers. You are counselors. You are uh, spiritual guides. You are uh, doctors. You are you know you are the the fixer, the relationship fixer. You're doing it all, and that's what a teacher does because. A lot of times we have got, we have this misconception, a teacher is just the person that goes in for academics. And I remember years ago, teachers were the group, the profession that everybody looked up to as a role model for their lives. And I just wanna, you know, thank you ladies for being, um, women of color that have stepped up to the plate um, to be more than just a teacher, but be a role model, be a friend, be a doctor, be a, a, a advocate, a, a, a spiritual guide for those kids, sometimes even a parent for those kids, because we need more teachers like you, because we have so many children that are falling through the cracks because we don't have, they don't have it at home and they don't have it at school. So I, I my I, my hat goes off to both of you guys. Yes. And um, yes. I can't pay you. <laughs> I can't pay you for what you're worth. I can't pay you. <laughs> but honestly, they can't either. <laughs> right. right. Oh.
goodness. Well, well, ladies, I'm gonna say this. I, I really have enjoyed both of you on today. And I and I, I again, you know, Tara, we <laughs> the shows are good. They're getting really <laughs> good, um, especially dealing with issues with the COVID-19, uh, with all of this being new to all of us, never being in this place before. Um, I really feel like it's a whole lot more we actually need to discuss about it. Um, because there's we like to talk about a problem, but we also like to offer a solution. Um, and a lot of it would be, ideally it would be a good way, a good thing if teachers and parents could actually bridge the relationships because it would help the children so much more if everyone could get on one accord because, you know, it plays, plays different roles. You got one situation at school, but then you're going home to a different situation it kind of confuses children somewhat and, and, and then they're all over the place. So if we could really, you know, work together and parents that are watching too, listen to your children sometimes. It's not always the child sometimes, you know, I, I, and I had to tell my daughter because I'm having a transparent moment because um, we had some issues with two of my grandchildren. I was like, don't be so quick, you know, to just jump at them because it may not actually be them. We did find out it wasn't them, but sometimes parents, you got to listen to your children, but you also have to know your child mm -hmm. as well when your children are, are telling you things. So one thing is, is parents listen to your child and also communicate properly with the teachers because teachers are spending a lot of time with your children, not just dealing with things as far as what they're putting on a paper or what they're reading out of a book. They're actually dealing with your child overall as a person. So parents, we have to be more receptive to what the teachers are telling us and sharing with us about our children and keep those lines of communication healthy and open. Um, so maybe we can do another show at some point where we can really talk about it. Hats off to you ladies because you're doing a wonderful wonderful job um and you all actually have the heart of a teacher to me um so i do thank you for sharing your information with us today and again before we leave right quick if you can tell us um what like gabrielle if you can give us information about your website your facebook page because your tutoring you do it virtually as well maybe somebody who's interested in reaching out to you to get that assistance Rosalyn, you right here in our hometown <laughs> And I'm, I'm pretty sure if anybody has any questions or need any help with anything, I'm pretty sure Rosalind is open to you all just sending her a message and she'll be able to help you out if she can. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. And um, thank you for sharing that. And thank, I'm so grateful that y'all have uh, invited me on this show. Um, if parents have any other questions, they can reach out to me on Facebook. Um, my Facebook name is the innovative learners um so the innovative learners with an s at the end my instagram is the innovative learners um email is contact at the innovative learners.com and um the website is www.theinnovativelearners.com so just the innovative learners all around you'll search it you'll find me um Feel free to DM me, email me if you're interested. Um, we off we are offering a lot of um, programs and um, resources and discounts for uh, family members who are affected by COVID. And um, we are bringing on a lot of a powerful new group of teachers. Um, all of my tutors are um, certified teachers, so none of the you know because I did it when I was in um, college. No college tutors. They're all certified teachers, experienced in the classroom. Um, so we would love to um, provide whatever resource that any parents out there um, they need. Roslyn? Um, well, you know, I don't, um, I, I'm on Facebook under, um, <laughs> and of course, I mean, I'm, I'm under, uh, right now, currently, I'm under, um, in Richmond County, um, and I'm just under Roslyn Cato. And on Facebook is Rosalind Britton Cato, but if you put in Rosalind Cato, it'll come up too. And if you have any questions, you can always get in touch with me. Um, I have 
My email is rosalindcato at gmail. I have so many emails. <laughs> but now, <laughs> you can get me at that one. That's where most of my uh, business things are because you know, I write books, I edit books. Um, and um, if you have any questions and if you can't get in touch with me, you can always get in touch with Tara. She can, <laughs> she can reach me. I'm glad you said that because I was going to say, I said, you didn't say anything about that you editing books. I was like, yeah, because I've edited all of Tara's books. So cool. Um, oh, yeah. I also want to say that I will be doing an Instagram live tomorrow with um, Melanated Mama. And um, you, if you just follow my um, Instagram at The Innovative Learners, um, I'll be live and we'll be having like a more in depth conversation about um, specific ways that parents can. Uh, help their students during this time because this is a very hot topic. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> we'll be going into more of that. It's going to be at 7 p.m. Um, on Instagram Live. I want to make sure I have that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you guys for joining us today, tonight. This has been Talk Therapy. Um, this has been a very interesting conversation, very um, inspirational, very empowering very um, educational. I thank you guys for joining us. Make sure you share this video. Share it, share it, share it, because so many parents need this information. Um, we look forward to having you ladies back on. I did, um, let me just say, we did get a message from the other um, uh, person that was going to be on. She was just getting off her meeting. So the next time we meet, we'll have her on. She's an assistant principal. That's Frida Howard um, in Augusta, Georgia. So um, you get you ladies have a great week. Be safe, and we enjoyed having you on. Um, Melody, you want to say anything before we close out? No more than thank you, ladies, for coming on. I really enjoyed you all. And that's it, Tara. I'm good for this week. No, all thank right, you for you having me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Remember, this is Talk Therapy, where our conversation is real, raw, and relevant. Have a good night. Y'all have a good one. You too. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.